All right, well, with me today on uh, the Rest and Recovery Podcast is Mr. Quinn Sandler, CEO of Plantiga. Quinn, yep. thank you so much for uh, joining me. My pleasure. It's uh, it's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, as we're kind of talking offline wearables, it's definitely, uh, it's still new, but uh, it's, I think, ready to, to take off. But uh, you guys have your own kind of view on it and or take on wearables. So it'd be really interesting to see how you guys go about that. But um, give me a little bit of background uh, on this. It sounds like the start of Plantiga was a bit of a family affair. Yeah, totally. So I founded Plantiga with my dad, you know, probably over a decade ago now, which is crazy to, uh, to say. It was a side project for sure. My dad had a background in biomechanics and product design. And the thesis was always, hey, look, when you go inside of a gate lab, and you measure how somebody moves, it is literally one of the best lenses into diagnosing, tracking, and monitoring human health. Whether it's like a neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, orthopedic rehabs, measuring how people move is arguably one of the best ways of understanding their health. Because really it all comes out if you're in pain, arthritis, you name it. So the thesis was always, we need to take the lab and bring it to everyday people. So it's the democratization of that. So we kind of trucked around. I had a couple other startups. The sad part to this story is my dad got very, very sick with prostate cancer and passed away four four years ago now. That's okay. My dad sits on all of our patents. Norman was his name. Um, Our AI is called Norman, which is kind of awesome. Um, so definitely been a family fair. And when my dad got sick is actually when we hired our first employee, we raised a pre-seed round. So it was definitely kind of, it's deep and it means a lot to me of what we are doing. So it is like a family affair, even though I'm the only one here. Um, it is definitely that feeling. And then what's kind of nice is obviously we're carrying on what my dad's unique perspective was, which is what I just described. It is this democratization of gate analytics. It's so valuable and very few people have access. So that was kind of the thesis and it still drives us today. Yeah, and I really appreciate that, that the heart behind the business too, of like just the desire now for you, I'm sure it sounds like is is the legacy. uh, Of course. Your dad's mission and your mission uh, carries on uh, to enable and equip people with that information. 100%, 100%, 100%. Um, so that's kind of the first I've heard though, like, I mean, I've heard it anecdotally from wearables, it helps with your health, right? Obviously the trackers, whether it's sleep or heart rate variability, but not from a movement perspective. No, I know. I've not heard it from that other than some obvious is like tripping or whatever might correlate to things, but maybe unpack that a little bit. Cause it's not. Yeah, totally. Heard. No. And I appreciate you saying that. Cause I feel like that's part of what we have to do as an organization is to educate. So to unpack that, let's say that someone is, let's say someone has Parkinson's to use that as an example. So we track a couple of people that have Parkinson's. I won't say his last name. One of our first individuals that we tracked, his name was Dwight, okay? Dwight um, actually had a very bad brain injury and then Parkinson's was triggered. So. How do we measure if Parkinson's is progressing or regressing? How they move. So things like ground contact time, stride length, things like gait speed, how fast they walk, how the length of their strides, the variability in their strides. What that tells a practitioner is, are the programs they're putting in place for this person that has Parkinson's, are they making him better? or worse, or are they falling off? So it becomes a proxy to really dive deep into how are they doing outside of heart rate, like like a wearable like Whoop or Aura, they're fantastic, but they measure how I breathe and they measure my heart rate. So they measure my heart and my breathing. That's right. really it. Right. So if you think of all of the people that have, let's say you rupture an ACL, so you, 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 you shredded your knee joint, or you're dealing with arthritis, movement and measuring literally your gait will tell me if you're getting better, if okay. you're getting worse, if my rehab is working, if you're good or cleared to go back to work, go back to sport. 
So this lens of movement and what I mean by gait is literally how the legs move. So the forces that they create, ground contact time is literally just how long your foot's on the ground, flight yeah. times how, how, how long your foot's in the air. You have all of the, the, these things, but they really tell us a picture about how you are. Okay. Um, so that is, it's not like this is us inventing this. This is well understood in research, but now this is the crux is access to that. Yeah, has yeah. been left for people that have brain damage or I'm going to pay and go and get a gait assessment at like a human performance lab or they live in universities. Right. Who can go to Duke University or like Chapel Hill and go pay to go into their human performance lab and get testing? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Because you've got the, the bulk of the universe that could use it, uh, not having access to your point of democratization or creating the accessibility. Uh, and, and it sounds like based on the thesis of what you guys are doing is like that could really scale and improving not just the human performance, but like minimizing injury to, you know, you know, as we age just for the everyday athlete, I'll call it like myself. 100%. The word that I use that my dad loves a lot is longevity, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we do the things we love to do for as long as possible? And if you've been around anybody who's in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, they just start to ache. Mm -hmm. Their body hurts, their knee hurts, their hip hurts. It's counterintuitive, but we know that you need to move more in order to reduce the pain. Right. So just imagine we measure movement. It's not like, sure, we focus on athletes now and we have a lot of competitive folks, but the vision is anybody that moves being able to measure one's health passively through their movement and that lens will, we feel strongly, will advance human health. And yeah. it just doesn't really exist today. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's something that we're very passionate about. And obviously we spend a lot of time thinking about, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool place to be. And it's nascent right now. Like, as you just said, not many people would think, oh, maybe I should measure my movement if I'm coming back from a knee surgery, right? Yeah, because if you're overstriding, well, I guess two ways at looking at it, if you can get the, the data beforehand, before oh, you- Super value, yeah, baseline, baseline data. But, right, the baseline to understand what it was before that may have been the contributing factor to the injury in the first place. Yeah. But then I guess even you could still fix a, I'm just rambling here, but- when they come back to get that baseline, that's more, I guess, idealistic when yep. they come back. Totally. So just imagine we do a lot of work with ACL. So we work with, I won't say their names, but literally the biggest players in the NBA and the NFL coming back from ACLs, as well as individual folks like me and you. Yeah. And there was like one big one in the Super Bowl this uh, past couple hundred percent. Yeah. Um, we're somewhat good friends with some of the staff on the Rams. And I would imagine we might be brought in to support that at some point, but you could imagine that I hurt my knee. Okay. Well, they say, if you rupture your ACL or your MCL, which is this knee joint on the inside of the outside of your knee, they say it's about nine months, but why do they say that? It's just time-based. It's not based on actually how the athlete is moving. Yeah. So lots of athletes will get put back on the field, let's say at nine months. But really, if you look at the quality of their movement and we start analyzing how they move, they might favor the injured side a lot. They might put more force on that limb. They might be longer on the ground on that limb, all of these factors. And then you have to ask yourself, what well, is that person really meant to go back on the field yet? Yeah. So we feel strongly that so many of those injuries are preventable. Right? Like if right. you hurt your knee, you have a 33% chance of hurting it again in the next two years, either your hurt knee or your healthy wow. knee. Like that's a staggering statistic. Now it's kind of like that statistic comes from more like on field sports stuff, but it doesn't matter. It is shocking. Actually, it's probably even higher. I would presume for the, the person who's not as athletically engaged, physically sound, totally athlete who's designed to do that. Granted, they have higher impact, but um, you know, if you're sitting all day, atrophying, like most of us, unfortunately, at the desk. Yeah, and you go on your hike on the weekend with your family, but you didn't really do anything for the last six days, and then boom, you're gonna like step on a branch and you're gonna hurt that knee again. And yeah. if you've ever been through an injury, an orthopedic in injury like that, it is devastating. Like 
Like, it's hard to put words around how depressing it is when we can't move properly. And I think that's almost a new thesis that we understand. There's a lot of members in our program, a lot of times when you actually ask them what we do for them, it is the mental component. Yeah. Like, oh, you got me. I haven't run in five years because I had pain. Plantiga comes in. We find some things that are really wrong. We give you exercises and stretches. We keep collecting and, and monitoring. Now you can run again without pain. And you ask them, like, how things are going. They don't care about the, the sensors. They say, oh, my God, I can run again. My mood. I feel great. Like, it really just comes down to a human element. They're like, yeah. oh, man, I'm pumped. I can do stuff again. Like, that's why we do what we do, you know? Well, it's funny you said that because as you were talking before, I wrote that down of the mental side because I started thinking about, like you were saying, it was it was guesstimate on the range of yes. when you could. And then that favoring may not even be the physical, but the mental aspect of the injury, right? How many times you go out there and, you, and you're like hesitant and that hesitation may actually be a contributing factor to further injury because you're, you know, offsetting, right? And you get that hitch in the giddy up. It's that, like, that is such a good point that I think is the, the placebo effect goes two ways. A lot of times we find people are just unsure. And then where we come in with, with data is we say, actually, no, Mr. and Mrs. Athlete, like the data says you're actually really good and you're not asymmetrical. Like you, and then that sometimes is the inverse. We're like, oh, okay, like I feel good. And then they can go back out there because you're completely right. When you are unsure about a limb, or an ankle or a knee and you go and do something it changes your whole movement pattern because you're now trying to compensate right which then which unfortunately it's called the bilateral like you then could injure the healthy side which happens all the time i'm trying to favor my knee i hurt a couple of years ago and then i hurt my ankle on my healthy side it's like this is a common common thing yeah. which doesn't have to be like that yeah and especially even just I mean, you have, you're kind of going against the stream a little bit with the injury itself, where you kind of have to favor it, right? So you're already yep. creating an over-dependence on the one side. Yeah. And then this is what kind of Matt, which you'll have on at some point is exercise is the medicine. Mm -hmm. So think of what we do. We identify that you're favoring your left side through a number of parameters. We figure out, look, you got a weak foot ankle complex and it's really weak when it hits the ground, but it's strong when it comes off the ground. So we're, we're going to prescribe these single leg exercises for strength, these types of stretches. We're going to continue to collect. And then that's how we see that change. Because of course you have to compensate, but I think that a lot of times with practitioners, let's say you're in a rehab, your physical therapist will put together a program, but it is guesswork. Yeah. They don't know if that's going to be beneficial for you. They just give you a program, usually on a piece of paper, they give it to you and you go home, but they don't know if that makes it better. Right. So again, that's where the data kind of comes into, we don't make our decisions on the data, but it, it's like the, it's like the, um, it's the, it's a supporting actor. The lead actor is the action, the data, the human connection. Sure. The data is the supporting actor that really helps us make sure that we're being as proactive as we can. So that kind of leads me into a question around, you mentioned practitioner a couple of times. So I, obviously it's kind of a user-based product, but is, do you guys offer it through like PT or certain doctors or what have you that would institute it into their practice or coaches? So it's a little bit of both. So historically we spent the last three years working in high performance sports. So with teams like the Dodgers and the Rockets and the Kings, some like big brands that we've been super supportive of the U.S. Tennis Association, NFL teams, all sorts of groups. Along with that, we've been in physical therapy, orthopedic surgeon groups, sport med groups. What we're doing now, though, is kind of the inverse. So it's what you just said. We're actually now taking that evidence-based care approach and we're bringing it to individuals. And they don't have to be an athlete. Lots of the people that are just more longevity focused, you know, 45-year-old lawyer that, you know, just wants to continue to run for as long as possible because it's like needed for his mental health. Um, so now we actually offer individuals this ability. And then what we do is we don't just give the technology, all of our members in kind of like a direct to consumer path, they all get hooked up with a movement coach. So think of like Noom or Wellery or Better Up, but we actually, every member has our sensors that get onboarded with a movement coach via Zoom. 
And then we build programmings in a relationship with that individual and we provide personalized recommendations, insights, and programs based on the data and then grabbing context from them. Okay. So it's as if we're, in a way, we're trying to reimagine what musculoskeletal wellness is for people. So yeah. it's very much a direct play. I think as we progress in the next couple of years, we will be working with practitioners where they can have our technology on their population. They can be doing their, the analysis and the program. And kind of like we have a movement coach, that surgeon or that, like we've been talking to John Hopkins, like that hospital will use us as the feedback loop to be collecting on their patients when they go back to their house in Ohio or something. Yeah. Um, but for now, we're very much focused on individuals ourselves and, you know, not to do a shameless plug, but, you know, if anybody is interested, if you go to our website, though, like you can request access. We're in closed beta, but we, we just are packing up our first cohort and we'll probably have two or three more cohorts over the next year. Okay. Um, but basically, it's taking what we do for NBA players and bringing it to literally anybody and they don't have to be injured. Like a lot of people that are in our program want to identify as injured. But if you actually dive deep, they're like, well, my hip has hurt for five years. Yeah. Or anytime I go really hard, my ankle hurts. So they don't identify as injured, but they're dealing with some musculoskeletal problem. Yeah. Some kind of chronic pain that you don't know the root cause, but it's just part of life, right? Like, totally. As, and as and they're very competitive. Start going. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I run a marathon three times a year and I have every year, but it's just, it kind of hurts me. And, you know, yep. I'm trying to optimize that because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get taken out. So, yeah. Yeah. It's that, 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 you know, tension between soreness and pain, uh, but, you know, fine right. line, right. Yeah. Too much or just enough is this fine line that you don't want to really. And that's where actually we do a lot of load tracking as well as like, you don't, if you haven't run in a while, you don't want to run too much too soon. You will get shin splints and tendinopathies. And like some of our coaching is literally just talking to them has nothing to do with the data. It's like, oh, you want to run a marathon in five months. You haven't run in a year. Okay. Yeah. Like don't run more than 30 min 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 minutes. Like you will hurt yourself. Like just yeah. take it easy. You know? Yeah. It's that distilling things down to, uh, you know, like the atomic habits I talk about a lot is, is that little bit every day, but we want that hurry up and get there, um, too often, especially when atomic habits is awesome. Like that is just I right there. It's, yeah. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely love everything about that. Um, I was just thinking about it though. Like, you know, when you, your brain is where you were, your body is where you are. Uh, and, and sometimes they don't, they don't line up, especially as you get a little, a little more seasoned like myself. Yeah, me too. I, dude, I'm 38. I'll be 39 in five months. And it's just, you know, it's just like we're getting older. Like even now I go skiing and my knees are on fire for like eight hours. You know, it's just not like when I was 20. Yep. Yep. We just went skiing this weekend and, and my lower back definitely tightened up a little bit. So it's like... So, so maybe to that point, is that even something in other sports other than just the foot gating? Is that, you know, an area that could be leveraged for other activities that have for movement sure. involved? Yeah. So we kind of say, look, if you move, we can help you. You know, it doesn't have to be a sport. So we measure, so let's say you get our insoles, you get a movement coach, uh, you do your first little, little onboarding session. Um, we measure walking mm -hmm. with precision. So this is not like step counting 10,000 steps. This is literally dissecting how you walk and just tracking and monitoring the intensity, your amount of load, your AC, like it's really a, another level of detail. But there are people that just use our product for walking okay. that just wear it every time they go out for a walk. Um, we do a bunch of jump testing. So plyometrics, so single leg, double leg jump testing, that has applicability in anything. It could be CrossFit. It's tracking load. So if you look at kind of the, the sports, I guess, or the activities that we focus on, it's cycling, running, football, basketball, soccer. It's really any type of activity we can be very helpful on. It's more that we're almost sport agnostic or activity agnostic. It's more movement health and making sure you – are healthy and optimized and we're building resilience so you can go and do the things that you want to do. And that literally just might be playing with, with your kids. 
Yeah, and I think that goes back to your, you know, the original idea that you and your dad had on the longevity piece and being able to dial it in to, to define it for oneself, for everyone, individually, but also at the macro. Oh, yeah. You just think of like arthritis. Most people will need a surgery. So like arthritis goes through multiple stages, but you can prolong it. Like you don't need to get surgery for your knee if you have an arthritic knee. You, you can push that off. The longer you push it off, predominantly you will be better off, you know? That's a great point. I hadn't thought about that where certain mitigations or, or fixes can be delayed appropriately, not just because you don't want it or, or like it's not needed yet because, you know, as much as it could help, there are downsides to some of those, you know, fixes. Surgery is, I think, something that we should always be very careful of. Yeah. It requires like taking... A, a, a knife and cutting through flesh and cutting through nerves. And yes, there's amazing surgeons out there, but in general, I think it's something that we ought to be very, very careful on when we decide to go and cut our bodies to do surgery or replace parts, replace joints. Um, very helpful, but a lot of people I think might not need them that end up getting them or they get them too soon. Yeah, and it seems to be a broad theme as of late in healthcare as a very broad category that, um, you know, it turns into this binary conversation of like good or bad or, but it's really more dialing in the, the application and the when, like being able to discern, okay, now's the good time for surgery. Okay, no, maybe it's maybe six months later or a year or two where it becomes like the default sometimes. Does that make sense? hundred percent. And this comes back to kind of what, again, Matt pushes on our company, but is what we call N equals one. So in research studies, N just means the number, you know, you'll have like a study N equals 500 or et cetera. N equals one means comparing you to you. And where we feel strongly, not just the democratization of key analytics, but this idea of personalized. And that's so what you just said, like you are different than me. Even if we both have a knee issue, your knee issue is so much different and unique to who you are. It could be mine is worse and I've been less time or more time post-op and yours less. So I think what's really important is being able to understand and determine how you move and yeah. then how that changes to you. And that could be an injury, performance, anything, but it's so unique that I think we, like, we're going to look back on this time in 10 years and think, man, like, we were so old school in 2020. I'm serious. Like, yeah, like, right. like, like we were making like, and this personalized healthcare, whether it's now cancer or other pharmaceuticals, like it's crazy how personalized I am very confident the world is going to move in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. And you know, it's, as you were talking about the personalization, I just started thinking about, you mentioned CrossFit and recently saw about squatting and your hinge and like everyone's physical height, and build is different. Like I'm, I'm a different. Little, I got longer legs, short upper torso. So that my hinge point is going to be a little different than somebody that's, and I'm six, two, that's going yeah. to be different than somebody that's five, four, that might be more evenly proportioned. So being able to adjust, you know, functional movement, we talk about functional movement a lot too, is like, and be able to do it better. Yeah, totally. Like, yeah, that's, that's as, that's as clear as day. We cannot it's very hard, I think, to apply a framework of an exercise or a required range of motion, whatever, to everybody. I think it is like, I'm like you, I have a short torso and super long legs. I'm six foot. So it's just like, I move in a different way than somebody else, you know? So, so that being said, you've got kind of like the, the two ends of the spectrum, the personalization, dialing it into the individual. How do you come up with a baseline so that you or anyone who's doing assessments can assess effectively to know, you know, the, the prescription? Okay, here's the proper baseline. Yeah. For movement. So baselines are very interesting. There's a healthy baseline. There could be an injured baseline post-injury. So it is just a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. And if we can get a healthy baseline, phenomenal. How we get it is, you know, in research, it says about five times that you have to do that healthy before we get enough data to really establish a baseline. So for us, 
our baseline in our program is over two to three weeks. So people come in, we'll get them to do, depending on what their goals are, jump testing or their run test five times to really understand how they operate. On the injured side, if they're injured, you can collect a bunch of data and build a baseline. Like they, like they might be 30% asymmetrical on one side because they're coming back from a sprained ankle. Well, yeah. that still gives us a really good picture of where they are today or the kind of this couple week. Um, and then we track away from that window and that baseline. Okay. So sometimes if I have a healthy baseline, I'm tracking towards that. If I have an, have an injured baseline, I'm getting better. I'm tracking away from that. Um, but the baseline is a phenomenal thing. So yeah, we very much, we kind of talk about it like a movement signature, but we get people to build a signature of how they walk and how they run and how they okay. jump, whether they're injured or healthy, that really establishes that signature of who they are. And then we start monitoring and assessing deviations outside of that kind of bandwidth. Okay. And is that where like the, cust the, the coach would then come in and be like, okay, Here's do these little activities and then you continue to assess on improvement and like, okay, maybe dial it back this way or that way for the adjustment. That's pretty much it. Yeah. So we call them essentials, but let's say that you start off and your goal would be to, uh, you know, let's say you're not injured. Your goal is just to build resilience. We would get you to do walk, run, jump tests, figure out what you're doing for activity, whether it's biking or cycling or hiking. And then we would set some targets of what we want to get that data to. And yeah. then we would select a little bit of a monitoring schedule. We would provide exercises and uh, stretches and programming. And we are going to track how we're progressing towards these targets that we want to hit. We usually go in like a two to three month cycle. Um, and then we have to adjust on the fly. So the movement coach is both looking at that data talking with you, assessing what the goals are and what targets, what parts of the data we're going to be love, love looking at and trying to get to, and then driving the recommendations and the personalized reports every single week. Like someone gets a report on Friday every week that really dials in what's happening and kind of some insights on what to work on for the following week. Awesome. That's really cool. I really like the prescriptive. And I think it helps too where we talk about atomic habits, dialing it in so it doesn't feel so big because that's often the overwhelm is, is that mindset piece that most of us, uh, regardless of success or not, run into that challenge. Um, and when it comes to movement or anything you do, really. You know, it's funny on that in CJ, our uh, chief commercial officer kind of drills that in too is, we were asking our members early on to do all of the tests, walk, run, single leg jump, double leg jump. Adherence wasn't really that high. It, it, it was quite interesting. Like a pro athlete will do it because their team's asking and paying them. Right. But an individual, you kind of have to start slow. So we start, hey, look, like you're coming back from a knee injury. Like, let's just have you wear Plantiga on your walks and then maybe do one little jump test before you do your rehab stuff. But you have to keep it small. You have to keep it manageable. And yeah. that's something that we are trying to work. And so that book is actually something that all of our movement coaches read because that is what we're trying to instill as well. Yeah. Um, we're trying to do behavior change. And if you think about it, what's the purpose of a wearable? Like most wearables do not do this, but you're trying to instill behavior change. Right. Um, and that's not easy to do. But once you can do that, you're going to change someone's life. And that's, you know, that's the goal at the end of the day uh, is transforming lives um, for the better. The preaching in the choir. Like I, <laughs> it, it is what drives us though, right? You know, yeah. like I don't think people care about, not that they don't care. People are um, indifferent with gate analytics. Like I talk about gate as lens. If they could wear a sensor that was the size of, you know, a penny and put it in their pocket and it could do the same thing, they would do that. They don't care that it sensors in an insole. They don't, right? They, like, it, it, it's just a means to the end. The end is what can you do for me to change my behavior, to correct something, to make me stronger? That's what I care about. I don't care about gate analytics. It's just a really effective lens to drive behavior change and insight. 
Um, so I fully believe like we're trying to make the change. It doesn't, who cares about gate analytics? We're trying to like make change. This is just one of the best ways to affect, analyze and understand that change. Yeah. Yeah. It's drawing that connection. Like I think what atomic habits is, uh, going to get sold a lot after this conversation, uh, <laughs> great book, you know, and drawing the connection between the what and the why and, yes. then, and being able to get yourself bought in on, on yes. that concept. Yeah. And you know, people don't realize that they can change. Like life is like not, life is not what gets thrown at us. We are powerful beings as humans and we have the ability to change. Something is not right. We can fix it. We yep. want to get stronger. We want to run an Ironman. We want to lose weight and like, you know, champion our health and fix our sleep. We can do that. We're not, yep. we're not at the behest of the world. That's why I think that book is awesome is because it breaks it down into tactical strategies to actually how to change your habits. And, and empower the individual. Like you were kind of addressing there is like you're empowered. That, yeah, there's some things that are external that influence, but at the end of the day, you're you're the steward of your ship or the captain of your ship. Uh, oh, you know, don't get me started. <laughs> so my dad, not not to come back to my dad, but we have, we have healthcare that's public up here in Canada. So my dad had some of the best cancer doctors, oncology in the world. And the amount of mistakes that I caught blew my mind. And what I just mean by you have to control your health is we as humans cannot actually rely on our doctors, our surgeons, our physical therapists. You cannot actually give your health to someone else to look after. You have to be your advocate for that. And again, that's another thing that I think is going to change here is people will start taking their sleep, their recovery, their move into their own hands like never before in the next, you know, five years. I think getting your blood tested yourself, like it's just, we're in for such a dramatic change, I think in the next five to 10 years. And it is just what you just said, like we are the captain of our ships and you cannot as a human being think any doctor, any practitioner is going to see everything, track everything. Like they handle hundreds or thousands of patients sometimes. Yep. Yeah. And whether it's mixing up a case or just like the complexity of the human system, as much as we've learned, we're still, we're still trying to figure things out. And that's why it's called practicing medicine because it's, it's an evolutionary thing. And I, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I mean, you could say that for any, any, thing for, for excellence, but like understanding the context that you're speaking to is they only have so much of a view and no one person has the market cornered on intelligence on any topic. Like case in point, I had basically like, um, like I was like weeping in one part of my hair here and I go and see a, a, uh, what's the skin doctor called? Um, oh, anyways. What's, what, what's a skin doctor? Can I, I can't believe that escapes me. Anyways, they basically said, look, it is an expression of these five things. We don't really know what it means. And you think to yourself, like, I don't understand that. So modern healthcare is not even asking me about my diet, my yeah. gut. It's not asking me about my sleep, my cortisol, my stress, the enzymes. I'm a big fan of the functional medicine world. Mm-hmm. not the homeopathic or natural, but the evidence-based, but treating the human as an entire system, right? How I eat, my gut bacteria, what's on my skin, right. the chemicals I'm ingesting. So healthcare, you know, we have a long way to go to is, you know, it's, it, it is practicing. They're, they are far from having it dialed in. Well, and I think if anything, of a positive balance over the last two years. I think that is the big catalyst. I think for many, yes, uh, that will, will be less dependent and more taking charge and not, I would say challenge in a disrespectful way, but ask questions, better questions on what it means or getting that second opinion. I think too often people are just willing to ingest whatever they they're told to ingest or whatever it is. Um, and just challenge the individual a little bit to ensure it is the optimal choice for you in that moment. So I come from a family of healthcare practitioners. My brother 
is the CEO of the nursing association here in British Columbia. Okay. And he was a practicing nurse for, let's call this 20 years. Just ask him what he thinks about doctors and surgeons. Amazing, but they move so quick. They, they, like, my brother has seen limbs taken off the wrong body, like, like hundred percent. It is like, you really do not want to go into a hospital if you don't have to. It is organized chaos. It's fraught like that. So it's not disrespectful. It's like practicing in the medicine world is very hard. It's very chaotic and a lot of mistakes and a lot of mistakes get made. And, you know, in defense of them, how are they supposed to know the context of a full human? And you know what I mean? Like it's like, that's the thing. We know very little about the human body still today, yet we know so much. Yep. Yeah. Um, Quinn, I, so what did I miss? Did I miss anything that I think Plantiga can really enable or empower the individual with? No, I think kind of just coming back to what you said about unpacking, I think a lot of people should just understand that they don't have to live in pain if they are injured, if they're going through some rehab, even if they want to get some performance game, like they want, they want to run a sub three hour marathon. Like it's not always injured. Like you need to be healthy in order to perform. So if you have dreams of performing, you have to be healthy. So they kind of are like two sides of the same coin. And it's just understanding that through the lens of movement, which is our focus, we can be very, very helpful. And it's not for everybody. Um, you know, like all of our members pay a subscription. So it's not like we do this for free, but you're getting like very elite level, kind of the best of sports science, the best of evidence-based orthopedic care, and then the best of kind of that sports science for performance. And really that's what we can be helpful with. So to your point, I think a lot of people are just kind of unsure of like, oh, like I have a whoop band. Like, like, won't my whoop band just do that? It's like, well, no, that measures your heart and it measures your breathing. It doesn't do anything else. So, you know, if you are trying to work on something in your body or some performance team, like that's just one lens. Right. Um, so no, I don't think you missed anything. It's just kind of reinforcing that point um, that, that that is a critical, like to us, we kind of think it is, part of the health stack that just doesn't exist in society. Like, you know, people will now get, like people are very aware of CGM. It's amazing. Yeah. Like I've yep. tracked my glucose a couple of years ago. People thought, well, that's a diabetic thing. Like that's what my like diabetic like nephew has and my, you know, grandma has. I feel like movement is going to be like that here in the next few years. That it is a part of the health stack. It's my glucose. It's my gut bacteria. It's my heart rate, my respiratory rates, my like skin patch sensors are amazing for like hydration. And then movement is this component that right now doesn't really have anything there. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, a, it, it's an important component for anyone that wants to live a long life, for anyone that wants to fend off an injury, for anyone that wants to perform at a higher level. This lens is, is, uh, is powerful. Yeah. I, 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 the first thing I thought of, I'm a runner. So like, I immediately was like, oh, this is cool. Like vertical oscillation and all, you know, your, your gait and, and all that. So I, I'm more on the geek outside of it, but, uh, I really appreciate the mission that y'all are, y'all have and, um, look forward to seeing where this goes. Uh, cause I think the great thing about it is it's probably the most passive utility from a wearables perspective. You know, you put it in your shoe and you go. Kind of like you're saying, if you put a coin in your pocket or whatever, but like even the wearables, you still have to wear it consistently or put them on, put them off, recharge them, all that kind of stuff. It's like the 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 ability to to measure and have ROI on that measurement. Um, yeah, it's big. So on that point, this is our take too. I think in the future, there's <clears throat> smart connected footwear is where we are going as a world. I do not, this is a matter of, of if, not when. Yep. There is no future where we as humans are not monitoring our health passively from connected footwear. I don't do anything. Just put them on, 
I do, I go about my day, my training, my running. And then insights get surfaced to me. Like we, so a big component of what we do is machine learning and AI. So we take all of our movement coaches and we're codifying that into a recommendation engine that AI we're calling Norman. So Norman as a movement coach will be telling you and like sending you a text or messaging me when something is off or it sees something like, hey, look, it looks like you're a couple of weeks away from rupturing a knee joint. And this is why we think that. And these are the things that you need to start doing right now. Like that is the future that I don't think is more than like a couple of years away. And like that to me is powerful as I'm just yeah. wearing it. It's in my footwear and it's surfacing things that it thinks I need to hear in order to live a long, healthy and happy life. And that's where I think the gate component's massive. Cause yeah, like it's not a watch, it's not a ring. It's just there in the background. Yeah, and I think you hit on a key point that I saw a, a friend shared recently some um, graph and it showed where people did a survey and where they were focused and preventative was like nothing. That was a random survey of people and you're kind of like, but that's exactly where we need to be. Totally. In the preventative side, because going back to the healthcare model, it's back end focused. Sick care. Yeah, it's sick care. And, it, and, and all of it, movement or food impact that future. And so if we get to that preventative care, what you're talking about, you can forecast or prevent a knee injury or whatever. Like, like again, you're like that to me, I think, I just wonder as a startup, are we too early? You know, like you think is like a, as an entrepreneur, you have to ask yourself, is society ready? Right. For something like this, like we more. might get thousands of members, but are we going to get hundreds of thousands? Now, I think we are. I think we're kind of right at that curve. And I'm I'm pretty positive over the next like two to four years, a lot is going to change. Yeah. Um, but as an entrepreneur and as a CEO, and there's this hat of like, you know, the unit economics and you have to build a business. And I think about that. And I think, are we too early? Because, you know, sometimes companies struggle just because they're too early like before yeah. facebook there was icq and lots of social platforms but they were a little too early in society yeah msn the messenger and aol like all of those were basically the same thing but of a different time so i no. think the world is going to change there now yeah that's a great question probably yeah an important one probably for you as the business owner and leader but um yeah again quinn i appreciate everything um I do close things out with a couple of personal questions. Yeah, do it. So what are you reading right now? I am reading um, a book called The Psychology of Money. Okay. Um, what's his name? Morgan Housel, I think. So it's nothing to do with my industry, but really is how people think of money. Um, but yeah, I it, it's mind-blowing. It, it, people should read that and just understand the concept of how we think about that, how we think about spending, the risk associated, the psychology of money. Interesting. Very cool. I'll have to check that one out. So what are you listening to right now, be it music or podcast? Um, podcast, oh, lots of like health and performance. I'm a big fan of the Tim Ferriss um, uh, show. Um, lots of ones that I... I'm kind of coming aware of even like yours, just kind of, there's so many amazing podcasts and great content out there. Yeah. Um, on the music side, I used to play music in a band that got a record contract in my early 20. So oh, cool. music is always on my mind. Um, there is a, an artist that people should check out named Maverick Sabre. It's like R&B pop in a way from the UK, but Maverick Sabre, unbelievable um, music. All right, cool. I'll have to check that one out. Uh, all right. What's your go-to rest and recovery method? Um, probably for me is meditation. So I grew up in a family that meditated. If I am feeling burnt out, if I'm feeling physically exhausted, the meditation component is critical for grounding myself. And then sometimes in a way I can, I can meditate and then go to bed man, do I have a deep sleep? So the meditation component is critical. And I've been doing a lot more cold therapy as well. So I feel like cold therapy, really cold bath mixed with the meditation um, is foundational to kind of how I rest and recover. Awesome. 
Well, Quinn, uh, how can folks, you said you're in beta, how can folks- Yeah, so about? if people are interested in joining, they should go to plantiga.com. Um, you can request access there. We are definitely trying to bring in folks that we feel are kind of fitting with our, uh, I guess, persona. Um, so we'll be opening up to kind of the larger group here coming up here in like six months, but we're in closed beta. We'll be doing a little bit of a launch here in March, but yeah, anybody would love to have them sign up on plantiga.com and you can request access there. Thanks, Quinn. I appreciate it, man. Cheers. Thanks.